everybody. Well, last week, uh, we witnessed Marianne weave very deftly through the maze of divine genealogy of the Greek gods. And she ended up, and I'm glad she did introduce us to the Simonides of Argos, of, of uh, Amorgos poem about the 10 types of women, nine of whom are uh, bad, evil, I think the word is in Greek, uh, and the one good uh, woman is the bee woman. The nine are like animals. And I really liked that I, Mary Ann's use of slides to illustrate the animals, because in all my years of teaching, that never occurred to me. And that was a great touch, I think. <laughs> really made Simonides come alive. So today, Mary Ann's topic is Greek heroes. And I think she's going to be talking about Hercules. Um, are there others as well? Not today. So Hercules it is. So mentioning Hercules reminds me uh, of a Herculean Zoom audience that Marianne had about a year and a half ago uh, when she gave a presentation in Athens at the American School, which is a research institute uh, that deals with archaeology and uh, classical Greek, uh, ca classical Greek and um, it was on her research, it was part of a series, her research on equestrian statues uh, in ancient Greece. There were a series of uh, lectures and she was one of them. Um, when I inquired, I discovered that there were 30 people in the audience in Athens. There were 900 folks on Zoom, which I thought was must be a record for uh, a faculty talk. Anyway, here's Marianne. It's great to be back here with all of you. Today, we are not going to talk about evil women anymore, but instead, we are going to talk about uh, heroes in the Greek world, and one hero in particular, Hercules. Heroes were considered by the ancient Greeks to be figures from the distant past. So while we might think of them as mythological figures, to them, they were historical figures. There wasn't anybody who could remember these people, no one who's, you know, not even a grandfather who could remember these people, but they were considered to, to have lived in this distant past. Now, there's a certain pattern to heroes, and when we look at uh, Heracles, Roman Hercules, we'll see some of that pattern. And there are lots of other heroes. We're just going to focus on him today. Most heroes have either a divine parent, so one of the gods or goddesses, or something weird about their birth, something unusual about their birth. They usually have to do something impossible. If you think about uh, Perseus, for example, is the hero who has to bring back the head of the Gorgon. And of course, the Gorgon will turn you to stone if you look at her. So that's a seemingly impossible task. They often go on quests. We're pretty familiar with quests these days because the Lord of the Rings is still popular, the, the quest motif where a group of people have to go and, and do something. There are kingdoms to be won, right? If you're successful, you're going to get a kingdom. They often have divine help. They have a god or goddess or some other divine figure that is going to work with them. They sometimes have a male buddy, okay? And of course, they run into trouble sometimes from the ever evil, the tempting female. Not every hero faces all of these things, but these turn up in most heroic stories. Okay, so we're going to look today at Heracles. You probably know him better as Roman Hercules, but same person, two different spellings. I always tell that to my students. We're transliterating from ancient Greek, so that hard sound of Heracles could be in, in English a C. It also could be a K. So these are the same person. And then Roman Hercules. Of course, most of us know him from Walt Disney's version. Spoiler alert, Disney didn't get it exactly true to the ancient story, as we'll see. 
um, I, growing up, knew him from this even less accurate uh, cartoon. I don't know anyone familiar with this one. This was when I teach mythology. Sometimes I sing and I can't sing at all, but I can't resist. He had a song, Hercules, hero of song and story. Hercules, hero of ancient glory. With the strength of 10 ordinary men, he's the mighty Hercules. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my late husband used to say that it was cruel that I did that to the students. They were captive. You're captive too, but you could lead. Anyway, the mighty Hercules, this was really off. There was a centaur that talked and there was an evil sea witch and everything, but still just shows you the persistence of, of this character, Hercules, the hero. Now, you might be surprised, but there is no one Hercules text from the ancient world. There are poems, there are plays, there are all kinds of things, but there is no one literary work that covers everything. So we have to piece together his biography, as it were, from lots of different sources. He is, however, the greatest Greek hero. The Greeks considered him to be the greatest of all the Greek heroes. And as such, he shows up everywhere. Every city wants to have some claim to the fact that, yeah, he was here and he did X, Y, Z. So he has many, many, many stories. And in fact, one of the common expressions was by Hercules or by Heracles, the way we might say, you know, by Jove. People would say by Heracles. This is a sixth century BC Greek vase that shows you the kind of Heracles in his complete outfit. He wore a lion skin, he carried a club, and he had a bow and arrow as some of his weapons. But he was also physically very, very strong. The, str the, the greatest hero and the strongest man in the world. Now, how does, you know, what's his origin story, right? I said in the heroic pattern, there's something weird about the birth, okay. So this is, we're going to look at his ancestors. We have to go to Perseus, the hero who killed the Gorgon. Perseus had three sons, Electrion, Alpheus, and Sphenolus. No worry, no test on these names afterwards. They had children. Electrion had nine sons, sorry, not by pirates, they're gonna get killed by pirates, but nine sons and a daughter named Alcmena. Alcaeus had a son named Amphitryon, and Sphenolus is going to have a son named Eurystheus. Okay. All right. So this is what I back to Electrion had nine sons. All but nine, all but uh, one are killed by pirates. And so he decides to avenge the death of his sons. He doesn't want to leave his daughter alone when he goes off to avenge, so he gives them to Amphitryon, who is, remember, his nephew. But somehow, he and Amphitryon get into a terrible fight, and Amphitryon kills Electrion. Okay, so what's going to happen? Amphitryon escapes to Thebes with Alcmena. Apparently, she's okay with this. She doesn't say, you killed my father. I don't want to go with you. She says, okay, let's go. So, so uh, they go to the city of Thebes, where the king of Thebes purifies them. There are rituals that can be undertaken to purify somebody of murder in the ancient heroic world. So whatever you needed to do is done, and he's purified of that murder. And he marries her, although, again, he murdered her father. But okay, families are complicated. But she says, she, she says, I'm not going to consummate the marriage with you until you avenge my brothers. Not, nothing about the father, but you need to avenge the death of my brothers. The pirates killed my brothers. Dad was going off to kill the pirates. You have to kill the pirates. Once you've killed the pirates, then we can consummate the marriage. So he says, okay, I'll go off. I'll kill the pirates. Meanwhile... Somebody else enters the picture. Zeus. Now, we've mentioned that Zeus is the head of the gods, but we've also mentioned that the gods 
very much behave like humans and not always the best qualities of humans. Zeus is married to Hera. Hera is the goddess of marriage. She's the goddess of marriage because she's constantly having to protect her marriage because her husband is constantly unfaithful. Now, he doesn't want her upset by his infidelities or to know about all of his infidelities, so he uses disguises when he goes about this. So this time he comes up with a very clever disguise. He disguises himself as Amphitryon, and he comes to Alcanina and says, I'm back. I killed the pirates. I avenged your brothers. Let's consummate the marriage. And she says, okay, you're back. And he shows her, you know, trophies and things. I killed the pirates. All right, you avenged my brothers. Let's consummate the marriage. So they do. But it's not Amphitryon. It's Zeus in disguise. So he goes away. Amphitryon comes home. Hi, I'm back. I avenged your brothers. I killed the pirates. Alcanita says, yeah, I know that. that was, okay. All right, let's consummate the marriage again. So she consummates the marriage twice, once with Zeus, once with her husband. She's pregnant. Time passes. It's about time for her to have the baby. Zeus is very excited about this, and he proclaims that on that very day, the day that she's due to give birth, a child will be born from his seed that will rule the world. And Hera says, on this very day, today, this very day, and he says, yes, and she says, okay. And she has her daughter, someone named Ailithuia, who is the goddess of childbirth, stay away from Alcmena. So if the goddess of childbirth is not there, she cannot give birth. And instead, she speeds up one of the sons of Perseus's wife's pregnancy, and she gives birth. So remember, Perseus is descended from Zeus. Zeus said, on this very day, somebody from my seed. Well, this is his seed. So she causes that to happen. The Roman writer Ovid tells us that poor Alcmena is laboring and laboring and laboring. A week has gone by, and she's still not giving birth to this child. And the goddess of childbirth is sitting outside her door with her arms crossed and her legs crossed and everything crossed so that birth can't take place. And one of the servant girls sees this woman sitting there all crossed up outside the door, and she kind of figures out what's going on. So she says, oh, good news. Alcmena has given birth. And the ch goddess of childbirth, Ailithuia, leaps up and says, what? And then unleashes everything, and children can be born. Okay. So Alcmena gives birth to twins, Heracles whom they call Alcides at first, and Iphicles. And these boys, one is the son of Zeus, one is the son of Amphitria. So one has some divine something going on, and the other is purely mortal. All right. Now, uh, apparently this can happen with dogs, but... It, it can't happen with people. You can't have that. But, but if you think about that, this is an explanation for something that they couldn't really explain, which we can explain, which is fraternal twins, right? They, they, they're born at the same time, but they don't look alike. They're not identical. So this was, the, this was an explanation for that. Just want to point out that Disney didn't go with that one, right? Disney had uh, Jupiter and Juno, or Zeus and Hera, holding little baby Heracles as if he were their own child. But no, not at all. But I think Disney thought that that story was a little much for, for young minds, right? right. So he, they, didn't, they didn't go with that. But just so you know, he was not the child of Zeus and Hera. He was the child of Zeus. 
Okay, so this child is born and he's going to become what we call a Pan-Hellenic hero. Many cities have local heroes. For example, the city of Athens has the hero Theseus who goes and slays the Minotaur. Even Perseus is associated with a certain region of Greece. But Heracles is a hero for the whole Greek world. Everybody in Greece thinks of him as, as their hero. And he travels all over the Greek world. And even, I say beyond, he goes to the farthest limits of the Greek world. And he even at one point goes to the underworld. And there's a huge amount of myths and tales and stories that again, we have to piece together from various sources. So I'm just, it's almost the tip of the iceberg, this sketch I'm giving you of Heracles. But we start out with his youthful deeds, okay? There's gonna be the serpents, the Milky Way, his education and training, and then the special episode of the Daughters of Thespius. So I have illustrations of all these things. We'll start with the, the serpents. All right, the twins are born, and the parents figure out that they're two different fathers, and one of them, you know, they figure out what must have happened, and one of them is the child of Zeus, and one is the child of uh, Amphitryon. But which one? Which one? Well, Hera, her plan didn't work, right? She didn't stop Heracles from being born, but that's okay. She's got another plan. She sends serpents to the baby's crib to kill baby Heracles. Well, this is a wall painting from Pompeii where you see that the family is figuring out which child is the divine child because little Heracles, the serpents come to his crib and here you see he's leaped up and he's killing the serpents even though he is a baby. And the figure, the man you see looking down is, is Amphitryon, his, his mortal father. The woman is his mother. But looking down on the whole thing, you see there's an eagle. The eagle is the bird of Zeus or Jupiter. And so dad, his real dad, is looking down saying, yep, that's my boy. She, she, she couldn't kill him with serpents. So because a normal baby, if you have serpents come into the crib, that's not going to work out well. But little, little Hercules does it. Milky Way. This is an unusual um, artifact that I'll talk about in a minute. The Milky Way story is that Zeus decided that maybe Heracles should have some divine baby formula, some divine milk, and he has Hera nurse Heracles. Well, apparently her animosity towards him is such that the milk doesn't taste very good to him and or that he bites her one way or the other, but he spits it out and it becomes the Milky Way. Now, this is a, an unusual artifact. It's from the Etruscans, who are a people in northern Italy who were in contact with the Greeks and ruled the Romans for a little bit early in Roman history, but whose art is always a little bit different from the Greek art. The style looks Greek or Roman, but if you look very closely, this is the back of an Etruscan mirror. It's an engraving. And there you have Heracles full grown nursing from uh, Hera. That's not something they would show in the Greek world, but it shows you that this story at least had spread to uh, other parts of the ancient world. So, all right, the Milky Way comes from him. Linus. This is a story that anyone here who's a teacher, including me, will not find this to be a particularly good story. But uh, he grows up to be Heracles strong, the strong, powerful young man, and he's trained in all the manly arts, hunting and archery, and he's really good at all these things, and wrestling. Not so good at the finer things, like playing the lyre and reciting poetry. And he has a teacher named Linus who tries to teach him, but gets very frustrated with him because his fingers are just too clumsy. He's just not doing the lyre. And he reprimands Heracles consistently about his failure to be good at this until finally Heracles gets upset and kills Linus, kills his teacher. But he is acquitted on the grounds of self-defense. Yeah, see, I don't care for this story either. But you see it on a vase. Can you see the, this is Heracles beating. Linus is holding the lyre up and Heracles is 
leading him to death. And that's one thing about Heracles. He's a hero who is one of great extremes. He can get very angry. He can also suffer great remorse for things that he does. And then I mentioned the daughters of Thespius. So he's, his father gets, his mortal father gets a little upset with the, the dead tutor issue and sends him off to go, go out in the woods and hunt and travel around to just get out of town for a little while. And while he's doing that, he comes to the home of a king named Thespius who invites him in and offers him hospitality. This is a concept in the Greek world that guests should be given hospitality and you should not do anything to violate that hospitality. You may know of one of the greatest violations of hospitality in the Trojan War when uh, Paris steals Helen from his host and takes her back to Troy, but we'll talk about that later. So you shouldn't violate hospitality. So he goes to, is welcomed by Thespius, and Thespius looks at him and thinks, you're a good-looking guy. He's a big, strong, strapping guy. I have 50 daughters. Wouldn't it be good to get some of this breeding stock in with my girls? Yep. So there are two versions of the story. Either Heracles is there for 50 nights, and a different daughter goes in every night, or, and this attests even more, I guess, to Heracles' stamina, he's there one night, and all 50, the, 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 the 50 girls go in one after the other. E either way, Heracles now has 50 sons. E eventually, yes, okay. I thought you would like that story. All right, so, you know, he comes to the age where you get married, and so he marries a woman named Megara, and it's true, right? Disney has him, you know, with little Meg, as she's called. So, so far, so good. She's the daughter of Creon, the king of Thebes. Hera's not done with him, though, right? She couldn't prevent him from being born. She couldn't kill him in the crib with snakes. So she drives him mad, and he kills his wife and all of their children. Disney didn't put that part in. No, no. And he's... He's devastated. I mean, he loved his wife. He loved his children. He didn't know what he was doing. He's, he's really very destroyed by this. And he says, you know, what, what punishment? What can, you know, I need something to punish me for having done this. And so the punishment is that he must serve his cousin Eurystheus. Remember those children of Perseus? Eurystheus is one of the children of one of the sons. He must serve him. And serving him, he must do whatever Eurystheus asks him to do. And Eurystheus is going to ask him to do 12 impossible labors. So remember, there's a, always these tasks, these quests that heroes have to do. Something that's interesting, if you look at Heracles' name, the first part of his name is Hera, isn't it? The second part, the Clay's part, is the Greek word, Greek word Kleos, fame. So he's actually famous through Hera, famous on account of Hera, not again because she's his mother, but because the suffering she keeps inflicting on him makes him do these great things. If Hera weren't after him, hadn't driven his family mad, he wouldn't be punished and he wouldn't have done his 12 labors, which are really what make him very famous. So he's actually famous through Hera, although, of course, that was not her intention. Her intention was just to get rid of him. So here are the 12 labors. He has to uh, rid the world of various kinds of monsters, and he has to bring them back to Eurystheus so Eurystheus can show that he actually did it. After the first one, Eurystheus is like, fine, I have a, a guy, his name is Caprius, he'll stand out here, you show it to him. I, I don't want, these things are too scary. I don't want to, I don't want to see them. But we're actually going to go through the 12 labors. The first one is the Nemean lion. Okay. This is a lion that cannot be killed because you can't penetrate it. You can't kill it in the standard ways. You can't shoot it with an arrow. You can't stab it with a spear. You can't cut it with a knife. So how are you going to kill it? Heracles wrestles it and strangles it to death. 
that's what you see here. He's wrestling the lion. These are all uh, sixth century BC Greek vases. He was a very popular subject for decoration on vases. So he's strangling the lion, and then he takes one of the lion's claws and skins the lion. So apparently the lion's own claws are able to penetrate its skin. He skins the lion, and that becomes his lion skin helmet that he wears. So that's what you see. And you notice the figure on the right, that's Athena. You said that heroes have help. Well, Athena doesn't necessarily actively help him, but he's one of her favorites. Athena is a virgin goddess, but she likes heroes, and she often helps them. And so here's the inside of a 6th century BC Greek drinking cup where she's actually pouring a drink for him. She's kind of taken off her helmet. She's not quite that warrior image, and she's, she's serving Heracles. The next one is the Lernaean Hydra. This thing is scary. I know Greek art never makes the monsters look as scary as they're supposed to be, but it's a monster with many heads. One head is immortal. The rest of the heads are poisonous. If you cut one of the heads, it gets more heads. It's really going to be a hard thing to do. He has a buddy who helps him, Iolaus, but while he's trying to kill the thing, Hera, never one to give up, she has a crab nipping at his heels all the time. But eventually they come up with a system. He cuts off a head. Iolaus cauterizes it so it can't grow another stump. And he eventually kills all of the heads except for the main head, which is immortal, which he buries a lot. And he takes the, the poison venom and dips his arrows in it. So now he's got poisonous arrows. What about the crab? He kills the crab. You're wondering, why am I bringing this up? He kills the crab, but Hera rewards the crab for its work, and it becomes the zodiac sign cancer, the finest sign of all the signs in the zodiac. I guess when I was born. <laughs> June. Okay, so... He does that. So now he's got his lion skin. He's got his poison arrows. He's got to get this deer. It's just a deer, apparently. It has gold horns. Not all of these stories are epic, but he has to bring this deer back. But the deer belongs to Artemis. And while he's getting the deer, he runs into Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, and, she, and her brother, Apollo. And Apollo says, don't mess with my sister's deer. And Artemis says, oh, it's okay, you know, fine, just, you know, once you show it off, let it go. So he takes it back and lets it go. As I said, they're not all exciting adventures, but then there's this boar. It's this terrible wild boar that has been roaming the countryside, killing people. He manages to kill the boar. He brings it back, and Ulysses is so afraid that he jumps in a jar to hide. And that's what we see here. Again, this is all; these are all 6th century BC Greek vases. The Aegean stables, this is actually a Roman mosaic, so it shows you these stories continue to be popular. Aegeus was a guy who had stables. And you know, if you have horses, you have cattle, you have to clean out the stables, right? You have to muck out the stables. He just didn't feel like doing that. So, Decades had gone by, and he had not cleaned these stables, and they were filthy. So Heracles comes to clean the stables. What Heracles doesn't tell Algeus is that he has to clean the stables. It's one of his labors. Instead, he bargains with him for a portion of the cattle, and then he will clean the stables. Okay. So in this Roman mosaic, he's going about it the, the standard way of kind of, you know, raking and washing, but what he ends up doing is diverting the course of a river, and it goes through the stables and cleans everything out. But then Algeus finds out that Heracles had to do this. He was required to do this, and so he says, I'm not going to give you what you asked for, and Heracles says, 
okay, I'll, I'll take care of you later. Which we'll see here. These birds, Stymphalian birds, these birds, they have feathers, but they shoot out arrows from their wings. So they're really deadly birds. But not to worry. Heracles gets some castanets and makes a lot of noise, and the birds fly up, and he just shoots them with it. Yeah, okay. I said they're not all, you know, epic things, but, but these are all monsters. So he's really ridding the world of monsters. He's somebody who protects people from scary things, even though they don't, the artistic versions are not necessarily terrifying. The ideas of these monsters were terrifying. And so he's somebody who rids the world of terror. Cretan bull, this was a bull that was in Crete. So now he's moved beyond the mainland of Greece. He's gone to the island of Crete, has to get this bull, gets it back to the mainland where it, he lets it go. And eventually the Athenian hero Theseus is going to take care of this bull. So it, this bull roams around a lot, but that's another story, Theseus getting the bull. Again, another uh, 6th century BC Greek vase. And there you see him, he's got the bull, and he's just driving the bull. The horses of Diomedes, you have to look really closely at this picture. You can see the horse. Can you see something coming out of the mouth of the horse? That's a person. These are man-eating horses. I know, which sounds, you know, really? But yes, they are man-eating horses. So he has got to kill these man-eating horses. And what he does is he uh, manages to feed their owner to them, and then he drives them away, and they're eaten by wolves. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, the girdle of Hippolyta. He needs to get the girdle of Hippolyta. Hippolyta is an Amazon. Amazons are warrior women. We talked about last time the Greek idea of women. So warrior women are considered to be very unnatural and very bad. But the Amazons are warrior women. Uh, there's a false etymology associated with their name that says it means uh, without a breast, because we do read they cut off one breast so that it's easier to pull the bow when they. They use men for breeding purposes only. Otherwise, they go around fighting. Although, in Greek mythology, they may be warrior women, but they never win a battle against Greek men. Not ever, not once, not a single battle. But anyway, he has to get the girdle of Hippolyta. Hippolyta is the queen of the Amazons. A girdle is a belt, not, you know, not like a latex girdle, but a belt that a woman wears, and there's symbolism attached to it. If you give someone your girdle, it means that you want to have sexual intercourse with them. If they take your girdle forcibly, it's rape. So he has to get this girdle. So he goes there, and you see on this vase, she takes one look at Heracles, and she says, here it is. Here's, here's my girdle. Fine. You, no problem. You don't have to worry about this at all. I'm giving you my girdle. Well, guess who doesn't like this? Hera. So Hera disguises herself as an Amazon and runs through the Amazon screaming, you know, betrayal, betrayal. Heracles is killing the queen. Betrayal, betrayal. So the Amazons rise up in arms, and Heracles is really confused because she, she, you know, she said, hey, you know, she said, here's my girdle. And he was all ready. And then now these Amazons are attacking him. So he thinks she must have betrayed him. And he kills her. He still gets the girdle, though. So, he, so the Amazons attack, and Heracles kills him. As I said, they're warrior women. They never beat Greek men. Not once, not ever. Now, his next one is he has to get the cattle of Geryon. And this is even farther afield. So he goes to the Straits of Gibraltar area where he sets up what's a natural formation, but which they thought was set up by Heracles, the pillars of Heracles. So he does that. 
Now, he has a problem. He's in, he, he's got to go across Africa to try to get these cattle. And it's hot. And Heracles, as we mentioned, he has a, a kind of a hair trigger temper, right? He can get angry. Remember poor Linus, the teacher. So he gets angry at the heat of the desert, and he shoots an arrow at the sun. And the sun just thinks this is funny. Helios, the sun, thinks it's funny. And he says, oh, you're so cute. I'm going to help you out. He says, you, you need transportation. So what I'm going to give you is the thing that I use. Now, remember, we talked about the fact that the sun is pulled across the sky in a chariot by the sun god. And we all know the sun rises in the east and the sun sets in the west. How does the sun get back to the east to rise again? Right? Mm, you hadn't thought of that. Well, in a big bowl, a, a cup. So the sun gives Heracles the cup to make the journey to get these cattle. And I, this is I just one of my favorite images of Heracles because he's in this cup and he looks so determined and yet he looks kind of afraid and he looks silly sitting in this big, this big cup. But that's how he's going to sail to get these cattle that he has to get. And the artist has shown you he's got to sail across the water because you can see sea creatures on the big cup. So Helios lends him the cup so he can travel to get these cattle that he needs to get. The cattle are guarded by a two-headed dog and a three-headed man. But not to worry, you can see the dog's dead on the bottom of this vase, and the three-headed man, well, he's sort of a three-torsoed man. He has one set of legs, but three bodies. And Heracles takes care of him, kills him. Some of these are pretty straightforward, except for the trip in the cup, which was pretty exciting. Next thing he has to get is the apples of the Hesperides. These are a wedding gift that was given to uh, Hera, and it grows on a tree, these golden apples, in a place that's in the far edge of the earth, guarded by the Hesperides, who are, who are nymphs. And they sometimes try to take an apple so Hera has a serpent there so that they don't, don't do that. On this trip, Heracles also gets instructions from Zeus to free Prometheus. Remember, Prometheus had, was having his liver ripped out by an eagle every day, and he had a secret that Zeus wanted to know. And finally, they reach a compromise. Prometheus gives Zeus the secret. And Zeus says, Heracles, you can unchain Prometheus. So Prometheus says to Heracles, apples of the Hesperides, that's going to be a hard one. What you need to do is get, uh, you got to wrestle with a sea creature. Then he's going to tell you directions. And then you get Atlas to help you. you. Remember, poor Atlas is holding up. Yes. OK. So he wrestles with the sea creature, he gets the directions, he gets to Atlas, and Atlas says, yeah, okay, I'll get the apples for you, no problem, but you need to hold the earth for me, because I can't do anything, you know, and, and Heracles says, fine, I'll hold the earth, and you bring the apples back. So Atlas goes, Atlas is not maybe as bright as he could be. Let's just say this now. So he goes and gets the apples, and he brings them back. And then he says to Heracles, um, you know, it feels really good not to have the weight. So, so I think I'm, I'm not going to take the earth back. No, I'm not. And Heracles says, I perfectly understand. It has been really hard doing this. I don't know how you did it all this time. And if I had known that I was going to have to do this for all eternity, I would have prepared myself a little better. But see, I just don't have it in quite the right position. To you know, I, I just need to adjust it. Would you mind taking it back? Well, I you know I need to get a cushion. I need, you know, uh, and Atlas says, Oh, sure. Yeah. 
So Atlas is still holding up the heavens. Um, this is what we call a metope. It's a part of the temple decoration of the temple of Zeus at Olympia. And it shows you this story. Here is Atlas coming back. He's got the apples. Here's Heracles with this kind of cushion issue that he's going to explain that he's got to get this adjusted. But that other figure who's just kind of standing there, that's Athena, right? I mean, she does no effort need to be exerted for her to hold this up. She's helping Heracles. But you can see that it's hard even with her helping for Heracles. And this is a late, this is a Hellenistic statue about this. This comes from the Baths of Caracalla, the Roman emperor. So this is a, a late, this is a Roman version of the story where you see it's a kind of statue that they liked in the Hellenistic period. It's like a trick statue. It's one thing from the front, but you're not quite sure. And then in the back, you see what the real story is. This is Heracles looking so massively huge, but so tired. Why is he looking so tired? You walk around to the back of the statue. He's holding in his hands the apples. So he's done this holding up. He's done all this epic quest. So just to show you, the first thing I showed you was from the 5th century BC. This is all the way down to the 2nd century AD that, that Heracles, Hercules is still popular. All right, next thing he has to do is get Cerberus. Cerberus is the dog who guards the underworld. Now, Cerberus doesn't guard the underworld to keep people from going to the underworld. People are not that anxious to go to the underworld. People are not, you know, hey, can I come in for a minute and just look around? No. He's really there to keep people from getting out. So Heracles goes in and he talks to Hades, ruler of the underworld, and he says, um, you know, I need to get Cerberus. And Hades says, I'll let you have him, but you can't hurt him. So however you can get him without hurting him, you can take him and then you, you bring him back. So Heracles just sort of puts a, you know, puts a collar around him and takes him. And this you see poor Eurystheus is terrified when Heracles brings Cerberus. Cerberus is a three-headed dog with, again, it's, this is supposed to be really scary in Greek art, and it always looks kind of cartoonish and comic to us, but Cerberus was a scary, scary thing. So here's Heracles showing Eurystheus, I got Cerberus, and Eurystheus saying, okay, good, fine, go, no more, please. And then he takes him back to, um, to the underworld. Now, remember Heracles told Algeus, you didn't give me the cattle, you cheated me, I'm going to take care of you? He goes back and kills him. And when he goes back and kills Algeus, he also founds the Olympic Games. We think of the Olympic Games as an athletic competition. But in reality, in antiquity, yes, it was an athletic competition. But it was an athletic competition in a religious setting. It was in honor of Zeus. The competitions were part of religious celebrations in honor of Zeus. So the Greeks believed that Heracles founded the Olympic Games in honor of his father. And at Olympia, there is a temple of Zeus from the 5th century BC that is the first place where we have the depiction of all 12 labors, the canonical set of labors. And they decorate this temple that was dedicated to Zeus. In the upper part, you see what's left of Olympia. It really is a fabulous site. It's just that you have to, it's not reconstructed. So when you're there, you have to, imagine what was there. So this is a reconstruction of the temple. And here are the metopes. Metopes are, uh, you can see, over the porch on the inside of the temple. Those are those square panels that you see there. And here are all uh, 12 of them. And the one that I showed you, remember the image of Atlas and Heracles? That is one of the metopes from this temple. The temple itself held a colossal gold and ivory statue of Zeus. You see the figures, you see a drawing, because let's face it, if there were a colossal gold and ivory statue of Zeus somewhere in the world, you would have seen it or you would have heard about it. It's lost, it's gone, but we have uh, coins that show uh, depictions of it. So this is what it looked like. 
And it was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, this colossal statue. Gold clothing, real gold, not, you know, they didn't go down to Michael's and get gold lame fabric. This is real gold and real ivory for this statue. Now, these journeys show you, these labors show you that Heracles went all over what was the known world. Everything, the Amazons are far away. He went to Crete. He went to the, we don't know where the Garden of the Hesperides is, but they thought it was somewhere in the far regions. So he traveled all over the Greek world, which is also part of why he is a hero for the whole Greek world. And he, there are a million stories with things he did on the side, which are called side deeds, believe it or not. A million stories that aren't the 12 labors. So he was a very, very busy person. He was a god that was particularly attractive to the Greeks who left mainland Greece in the 8th century BC and traveled to South Italy and Sicily to set up colonies and also to the east, to Asia Minor, to set up colonies. Because you can imagine, you're going out into the unknown, right? You're, you're sailing off to set up a colony. You're leaving home. And so you can think, Heracles will protect us, right? Heracles rids the world of monsters. We're going to a place where there may be monsters, but maybe we can count on, on Heracles to help us. So he was enormously, enormously popular. All right, well. You, you may have thought, okay, Heracles does 12 labors and then he becomes immortal. But that's actually not what happened. He does the 12 labors, so he's freed from his bondage to Eurystheus. But not out of the woods yet. There was a prophecy that Zeus had uttered that said, no living man can kill you. You will die by the hands of the dead. Dun, 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 dun. Well, yeah. So these prophecies have power. When there's a prophecy about something in Greek mythology, it, it has power. So this is, this is going to be what's going to happen to him. But how is he going to die by the hands of the dead? Well, he wants a bride. Remember poor Megara? He killed her. So he needs a bride. And while he was in the underworld with Cerberus, he happened to run into another Greek hero who's down there in the underworld because he's dead, another Greek hero named Meliager. And Meliager says, oh, hi, Heracles. When you go back up, look up my sister. She's really good looking. She's nice. Think you two might hit it off. It'd be a good match. So Heracles says, yeah, OK, I'm, I'm going to be looking for a wife when I'm done with all this. So he goes to look into Meliager's sister, who happens to have beautiful but unfortunately translated name of Deianira, which means man-killer. Right. Now, he can't just marry her. He actually has to wrestle a river god who is a rival suitor. So he has to go to a lot of work to get this woman to be his bride. But are we worried that the strongest man in the world is going to have trouble wrestling a river god? No. So this is kind of hard to interpret, but all that fishy, taily, scaly stuff is the river god. And you see the top of Heracles' head with his lion skin. So he is, in fact, wrestling the river god for her hand. And he is successful. He defeats the rival suitor. So now he can marry Deianira. Okay. Okay. So he's got man killer as his his bride, and they're coming back from the whole wrestling match thing, and they're crossing a river. Sorry, it says a reeve, but it should say a river. They're crossing a river, and the river is very deep, and there is a centaur there. And the centaur says, you know, it's easier for me to cross rivers. I'm part horse. Let me carry her across the river. And Heracles says, OK, that's great. So Deianira gets on the back of the centaur, and they head across the river. But the centaur did not have good intentions. And he tries to rape Deianira, which, of course, makes Heracles very angry. And Heracles kills this centaur, whose name is Nephos. This is a 
8th century BC vase that shows, there's Heracles, there's Netos on the uh, neck of the vase. On the shoulder of the vase, you might just be able to make out those are Gorgons, the other mythological stories on this vase. But on the neck, we have Heracles killing Netos. So he kills the centaur. But as he's dying, the centaur says to Deianira, Psst. and she comes over and he says, look, I'm dying, but I want to do a good deed before I die. Let's face it, you know, Heracles, he's a, he's a virile guy. You're probably going to have some trouble with him in terms of faithfulness, right? So um, take some of my blood. It'll be a love potion. If you ever feel like he's straying, just put this on something, give it to him, he'll be yours again. And she says, thanks, Mr. Evil Centaur, thank you. This is a Roman wall painting that shows the centaur dying, but in the background, the woman, that's Deanera. Now, Heracles, ends up being interested in another woman. What a surprise. Right. He's in an archery contest, and the prize is supposed to be somebody named Ioli, a girl. He wins the archery contest, but the father of the girl remembers that Heracles had already killed little Meg, right? I mean, he was driven mad by Hera, but still in all, if you're a good father, you don't want your daughter to be with somebody who's, who says, no, okay. So he goes away without her, but then decides he wants her, and he's going to go back and get her, at which point Deanera freaks out. What am I going to do? He's going to get this other woman. Ah, but wait. I still have centaur love potion number nine, right? All right, so Heracles has gone off. She gets one of his shirts. She soaks it in love potion number nine and sends it to him. He puts it on because, you know, he's thinking, this is great. It's beautiful. And then it starts to eat away at him. And he's in agony and he's writhing in pain and he's screaming. And he's begging someone to just light his funeral pyre so he can die. And everyone's afraid of him because one person gets near him and he throws the person away and the person dies. So they're all like, no. So finally, a guy named Philoctetes lights the funeral pyre. And as a reward for this, Heracles gives Philoctetes his own bow, Heracles' own bow. And this is, keep this way in the back of your mind, this is going to be part of the Trojan War story, believe it or not. So uh, then Heracles, the funeral pyre burns, and he is transported to Olympus, where he becomes, he lives with the gods, and he's given as a wife the daughter of Zeus and Hera, somebody named Hebe, who has no other mythology and just basically her name means youthful, beautiful thing. So he gets youthful beauty as a wife and he is immortal. So he's a, he, usually one thinks that, oh, he had to suffer through those 12 labors and then he earned his immortality. He had to do a lot of suffering in his life. He, he suffered for the death of his wife and his children. He suffered through all these labors. He had a few other incidents that he had to do things. He couldn't go over everything. There's just too much. But in the end, he becomes part of Olympus. He becomes immortal, and he has this beautiful wife. Although, Homer tells us that Odysseus sees the shade of Heracles in the underworld. So he has a kind of dual nature where he's on Mount Olympus, and yet there's a shade in the underworld. We're not entirely clear about that. So that's Heracles' Hercules story, not the version that Disney, but you can see now why Disney decided that the, the what did you say, real version wasn't fit for, for kids. So he's a hero of excesses, right? Great 
anger and great remorse. He kills people and he's very upset about it. Not just his wife and children. He's upset about killing Linus. He's upset about killing various other people. Not Augeus, because Augeus cheated him. But other people that he kills in anger, he's very sad about. His, his task is, again, to kill dangerous beasts, to, to rid the world of monsters. And in the end, he overcomes death itself, and he is immortal. Said he's a very popular figure. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Gladiator. You may recall the Emperor Commodus, at, played by uh, is it Joaquin Phoenix in Gladiator. And in Gladiator, the Emperor Commodus is insane. But the portrayal in Gladiator is just the tip of the iceberg of what the real Commodus was actually like. And I show you the real Commodus, I'm going to show you the real Commodus because the real Commodus actually believes that he is the reincarnation of Hercules. And so this is Commodus in his Hercules suit. This is not, I like to dress up as Hercules for Halloween. This is, I am the new Hercules. And so the sculptor who made this, some scholars think the sculptor who made this had a little bit of a sense of humor or was walking a fine line between appeasing the emperor and making fun of the emperor because the lion skin is too big, the apples are really small, the maybe yes, maybe no. But this is how Commodus wanted to be portrayed. So even you're going back from the 8th century BC all the way down to the Second century AD, we have Hercules as a figure in Greek and Roman mythology, a very powerful hero figure. So thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Marianne. I was struck by how uh, the Hercules theme is still with us, not just in movies, but I was thinking about expressions like folks cleaning the Aegean stables, uh, if Herculean task. <laughs> Herculean task, et cetera. Okay, who's got a question? Aren't there other um, heroic characters in other cultures, like the Mesopotamian cultures? There's a a uh, hero like this one, but he has a sidekick, and Gil I can't Gilgamesh remember his name. Gilgamesh and, and Enkidu. Gilgamesh, Say it again. Gilgamesh and his buddy Enkidu. Yes, and in fact, many scholars think that Hercules, Heracles Hercules is in fact the Greek interpretation of this idea which goes back to Mesopotamia, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh has to kill monsters. He has involvement with gods and goddesses. He has a buddy, Enkidu, who who helps him with everything. So again, it's it's a, a world with many interconnections. We talk about Greek mythology, but it, it the Greek world was not isolated. It's connected with the Near East, it's connected with Egypt. So yes, there's probably a lot of influence from those stories in this and, and in that heroic pattern that we've seen. You had a question. Oh, there's another. I've it, it just seems that uh, for a long time, uh, Hercules was sort of the model for what it meant to be a man. Hercules In, is the model for what it means to be a man, the, the strength of man and the athleticism of man. But in fact, the model for what it is to be a man goes to the Homeric heroes of the Trojan War. That, because Hercules is strong and he kills monsters, but the heroes of the Trojan War are involved in battle and, and those kinds of things. And Hercules' weapons are not state-of-the-art weapons. A club is not a sophisticated weapon. It's not a spear. So. It's what it, it's the strength of man, but not the other aspects of how you behave. People like Achilles, Odysseus, Hector, those are more models of how a man should, should behave. Because Heracles just flies off the handle constantly. So 
Yeah, but he's he's the strength and the protectiveness, but not some of the other more subtle aspects of masculinity. I'm interested in what you said about the fact that there is no text in which. Uh, God. I'm interested in the fact that you said that there is no text in which Hercules' life is presented from beginning to end in a coherent way. And I assume that that means that the 12 tasks, tasks are not presented in one text. Is that not true? That's true. Right. That's what right. If that's true, then um, that leads to my second question, which is. Is there any connection between the ordering of the tasks and and his life and ge geography? I mean, in other words, if you look at a map, is there is there anything you can say about that? Well, the, the a good question. The, the the first few tasks are on the mainland, and then yeah. it, he spreads out into farther and farther regions until. You know, he ends up in wherever the Hesperides are, but also the sort of farthest realm for humans, the underworld, right? Getting Cerberus. Sure. So it is, it starts out in the mainland and then it, it spreads out. And as far as the 12, the first real canonical presentation of the 12 is in art, in that temple of Zeus at Olympia, in sculpture, not in literature. But we assume there was a text that presented them that way in that order. It's just that yeah. although sometimes my students think we have way too much ancient literature when they have to translate it, we actually don't, we have very little ancient literature. So there was probably a text, a poem, something that established yeah. the order. So whatever speculation we have about the order comes from the task, yeah. the examination of the task itself. All right, thank you. There's a couple of compliments there in chat. It says, as always, you make the subject interesting and fun well, and thanks. excellent, and thank you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you all. You are always a great audience. I, I really do love talking to you, so <laughs> thank you. Mary Ann, thank you.